Hey guys, Mr. Poki here, back with another video. So after the previous video of me explaining Ching Chue's tower mechanics with the help of Chie, uh, I'm finally glad to say that Ching Chue's C8 unit analysis is now finally complete and I'm able to present it to you guys. Before we even proceed with this video, I just want to mention a shout out to Chie as well as another fella called Mittens. Uh, both of these players have also helped me extensively when it comes to a lot of the things that are involved with today's analysis. Right. So without further ado, let's get into today's content. So Ching Chue, or known as the Gambling Addict, or the Gambling Gremlin, or the Mahjong Girl, um, she has exploded in popularity this 1.1 MOC, especially because CN wheels they're tired of spamming silly and decided to mess around with E6 Ching Chue, which is a lot more attainable considering that she is the rig up 4 star in World Charts banner. Right? Uh, one thing to note is that E6 Ching Chue with good RNG has one of, if not the highest DPS in the entire game, especially against multiple enemies. Right? Another thing to note is the top probability of Ching Chue can also be calculated but due to the mathematical nature and depth of the entire topic I've already posted it in my previous video so I highly recommend you guys to check out that video before proceeding with this right uh, so for Ching Chue she also has one of the most unique kits in the game uh, with the highest potential skill point consumption main DPS uh, coupled with a really high difficulty of utilizing her to a maximum benefit uh, with regards to all her tower probability and her disc card mechanics all that kind of stuff and lastly like I mentioned at the start of the video Special thanks to Chaye Emittance for helping me with this analysis. So like I mentioned just now, regarding Ching Chue's tower probability as well as her discard mechanic, um, I highly, highly recommend you guys to check out my previous video on Ching Chue tower probability complete analysis, right? So uh, please try to understand this first before going into the build, otherwise some things in the build might not make sense to you that well. Uh, however, with that being said, if you don't really need to understand the mechanics behind how Ching Chue works and you really just want to know the build as well as how you want to utilize her, uh, then feel free to continue. So moving on to common misconceptions, uh, firstly, Ching Chue has very, very impressive base stats amongst the four star units, right? She has the highest attack uh, tied with servo, uh, fifth highest in HP and fifth highest in defense. So just by a base four star unit herself, um, her stats are not to be um, underestimated. Number two, Ching Chue starts a battle with zero tiles, right? She'll have no tiles in her hand and it will be plus one tile every single ally as well as her own turn. Keep in mind, this house they do not work with resurgence which is this resurgence they do not work with follow-up attacks uh, which is something like march and clara and they do not work with ultimate attacks right so only the unit's actual turn can ching chue actually gain a tau right so if ching chue is the fastest in the team let's just say ching chue is the fastest in your team uh, and she did not use her technique uh, she will only have one tau in her very first turn right because you start the game with no tiles at all number three Ching Chue's enhanced basic attack, which is after the hidden hand mechanic, uh, will not recover any skill points. Uh, I know this is already mentioned in the skill, but I think some of you guys may not even read the skills that much and you'll be wondering uh, why didn't I gain any sort of skill points after using the enhanced attack, right? Uh, the main attack will receive 240% damage and the side targets will receive 100% damage. So in that sense, uh, you ideally always want to target the one with the highest HP, which is the one in the middle with Ching Chue's enhanced attack. You can't really um, just randomly target an enemy just like uh, make like. Number four, Ching Chue's skill does not recover any energy. Right? So you cannot be spamming like four of Ching Chue's skills, uh, each of them giving you plus 30 energy in hopes of getting uh, enough energy for ultimate. Right? Uh, that being said, uh, the damage buff does stack up to four times, but also maximum of four times. So you will never really want to use five skill points on Ching Chue because the fifth skill point, uh, it honestly would just be her changing her tiles, right? She also cannot use a skill once four of a kind has been achieved. So the moment you hit four of a kind, uh, you cannot try to use more of your skills to increase the damage of their enhanced attack, right? Uh, when do we use Ching Chue's ultimate? This is going to be explained later on, right? So just stick with me over here. 
Uh, lastly, and I think this is going to be the biggest common misconception I left at the last because we always save the best for last, right? Um, Qingchue is completely functional at E0, right? So why do people keep thinking that Qingchue uh, can only be really, really playable at E4 is uh, kind of beyond me because E4's Autaki buff is basically just another added layer of RNG to potentially increase Qingchue's damage. Uh, the chances of you actually obtaining this buff is really unreliable and having the uptime of this buff affecting your final damage is also uh, really unreliable. And below are the following reasons. Right? So number one, your Autaki buff is a 24% fixed chance per skill usage. Right? There's no increasing percentage, there's no pity like in the gacha system, uh, it's just a 24% fixed chance uh, for, for forever. And as per the tower probability video, uh, you would most likely only use 2-3 to three skill points on, on Qing Chue. Uh, especially if you're going to be playing her efficiently to obtain four of a kind, right? So only with using two or three skills, uh, it can be quite hard to obtain this Autaki buff, right? You shouldn't really expect 100% uptime, even if you get her E4, right? So that's number one. Number two, Qingzhou's Autaki buff will not be triggered if the main target is killed by her basic slash enhanced attack. Because how Autaki buff works is it's a follow-up attack, right? It's an additional follow-up attack uh, after Qingzhou completes her uh, enhanced attack, whatever kind of stuff. But if Qing Chue already killed the target, then there is no more target for the follow-up attack to aim at, right? So this, this entire Autoki buff it will basically be wasted. So I do in this situation, you always want to aim for the higher HP targets uh, with Qing Chue. Number three, Autaki buff, they cannot receive any attack percentage buff from the four of a kind, right? This is pretty important. Uh, this is because the follow-up attack uh, provided by Autaki, it only happens after the four of a kind is already thrown, right? She has already used up the four of a kind cards to be hit at the enemy, so now she no longer has the four of the kind buff, right? So in this sense, the Autaki follow-up attack does not receive any attack percentage buff. But that being said, it does still receive any damage percentage buff if Qing Chiu were to be using her skill to generate the enhanced auto attack, right? So that's number three. On number four, Autaki cannot recover any skill points from E6's enhanced basic attack, right? Since this is considered as a follow-up attack. It is not considered as an enhanced attack, it is considered as a follow-up attack. So she's unable to gain any skill points from that. And lastly, this is not really like a bad thing, I would say, but it's just a little bit more of a misconception, right? Uh, it is affected by follow-up damage boost, right? Such as before Dawn, right? The Jingyuan's like cone, any follow-up damage boost is going to increase Autaki's damage. But it is not considered as a basic attack, and as such, it will not receive any basic attack boost, which is something that we get from the four-piece musketeer set. Right. So this is essentially Qing Chue's um, entire common misconception, and I think the biggest point is basically number point number five over here, because people don't really dare to want to invest in Qing Chue because uh, they were under the misconception that uh, you can really use her at high idling levels like E4 or E6. But I'm here to tell you, Qing Chue at E0 is completely functional. As long as you give her enough relic investments, just treat her like any of the DPS that you would put love and effort in. I guarantee you, she will output a substantial amount of damage, and she will not disappoint you. Right. So that is that for Qing Chue's common misconception. Qing Chue's ultimate usage, this is really interesting and this is also why I said at the start of the video, Qing Chue has a pretty high skill ceiling when it comes to really utilizing her effectively. Not only do you need to understand her tower probability and her discard mechanics, but timing when you use Qing Chue's out is also another factor that can set the difference between a good Qing Chue player and a great Qing Chue player. Right? So Qing Chue's out, it can be really flexible and using it at different times will greatly affect the damage as well as your skill point economy. Right? So knowing when do you use Qing Chue's out for each scenario can greatly enhance a player's Qing Chue experience. So generally speaking, there is basically three different kinds of usages. So for the first one, you basically get four of a kind using either your skills or you obtained naturally from the allies turn. Uh, then you use your enhanced basic attack, which is with the four of a kind, and then use your out. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two, you get a four of a kind as well with skills or naturally, but you do not release your basic attack first. You use your out, then release your basic attack. Now, some of you guys here may be wondering, hey, Mr. Pokey, wouldn't that be wasting the fishes that you could have gotten from out? Because uh, if you already have four of a kind and then use your out, then the out won't give you any fishes, right? But just hear me out until the end of the video. Now, for the last scenario, it's basically using our skills with Qing Chue, uh, but we didn't obtain four of a kind. But we have enough energy to cast our ultimate, and then we do our enhanced basic attack. 
So this is basically the three scenarios, the three usages that you will most commonly see with Qingquan's ultimate. But note that in all of these scenarios, and I just want to get this out of the way first, Qingquan is one of the only unit in the entire game that wants to use her ultimate during her own turn, right? You will never want to use her in an ally's turn or an enemy turn and only in her own turn. Now, why is this the case? It is because all of Qing Chue's in inner buffs, like her attack buffs from getting 4th of a kind, or her damage percentage buff that she gets from using her skill, they all expire within her turn, right? It doesn't last for more than one turn. So using her ultimate during her own turn will ensure the highest damage dealt against the enemy. And it's not like Qing Chue's ultimate have any sort of like additional abilities, right? Such as crowd control, or team white heal, or speed buff. It is just straight up a damaging ability. So for 99.99% of the time, you will always want to use Qing Chue's ultimate during her own turn. The only exception that I can think of where you wouldn't want to use her during your own turn is if you are faced with a dire situation such as if you are against an MOC 9 Coca-Cola and she's about to cast her ultimate and destroy an entire team uh, then using King Chris out to cut in and break her toughness to the bar will save your team uh, then go ahead and use that but for all other scenarios from a damage perspective from a skill point perspective everything uh, only use King Chris out during her own turn right? so let's go through the three different kind of usages with King Chris. Uh, number one, which is the uh, getting four of a kind, either through skills or naturally, uh, and then using her enhanced attack, and then using her heart. Right. So enhanced attack, it can be achieved either through allies turn or the change turn or your skills, and this also provides you a chance to gain E4 buff if you're going to be uh, using her skills. Right. So the important thing here to take note is, if we were to release our enhanced attack, which is the four of a kind, and then we cast our ultimate, then our ultimate will lose the attack bar from here in hand, right? Because we have already used up our enhanced attack to attack the enemy, and therefore our ultimate will not gain any form of attack buff itself. Uh, but that being said, it will still gain any damage buff if we were to use Qing Xue's skill during her turn this time, right? Then the benefit to this is even though our ultimate loses a little bit of damage because we don't really eat the full attack percentage buff, um, the benefit is that the turn after this, Qing Xue will be guaranteed to have another Four of a kind, right? Because the ultimate uh, gives us four fishes. Now, this may seem like a good thing as service value because it basically guarantees us to get um, four fishes without spending any skill points and all that kind of stuff. But the downside to this is also uh, our enhanced basic for the next round, which is our four fishes, we're unable to gain any skill damage buffs, right? Because, like I mentioned, when Team Shield already has four of a kind, then you're unable to use her skill at all, right? Um, but that means that you still at least get the attack buff from Hidden Hand. So, that's generally how this works. So the pros for this uh, combo is that it is extremely skill point friendly because you're guaranteed 4 of a kind on the next turn and hence you basically don't need to spend any skill points with Qingquan at all. Right? On top of that, our very first enhanced basic attack can both get the attack percentage buffs from 4 of a kind as well as any damage buff if we get our first enhanced basic with our skills. Right? So that's our pros. Now the cons to this is it has the least amount of damage output compared to the other two ultimate usages right? because our ultimate loses the attack buff from the lack of a 4 of a kind and our next enhanced basic loses the damage percentage buff uh, from a lack of skill usage, right? So this thing is a very slow but steady way of ensuring that we do have four of a kind, but the numbers we see are not going to be as big as the other two scenarios, which you guys will see, right? So when's the ideal situation you want to use this? The ideal situation is uh, basically when you have very, very low skill points or no skill points at all, then you will want to use this scenario, right? Because this will basically mean that your team track can always guarantee uh, a four of a kind after casting an ultimate. You don't have to allocate any skill points and the rest of your skill points can pretty much freely go to your main DPS or support zone account stuff, right? And this is also really good for players who do not want to gamble because it basically guarantees you get a four of a kind in your next cycle. Now for the next ultimate usage, the only change is instead of casting our enhanced basic attack first into our ultimate, we're now going to cast our ultimate into our enhanced basic which is going to be essentially throwing away uh, the four of a kind we get from the fishes, right? Now, how does this work? So we still use our skills to get four of a kind, and then hopefully we can cast our out over here, and then we will cast our out even if we get four of a kind, and then we use our enhanced basic attack. Now, this is the highest possible damage, right? Because both our ultimate as well as the enhanced basic attack receives the attack percentage buff and the damage percentage buff from both four of a kind as well as using her skills, right? So this has the highest damage output. So using our ultimate before using our enhanced basic attack, which translates to we're not going to get any fish, uh, means one less four of a kind for the next attack, and therefore we will need to gamble again uh, from our ally and QQ's turn after this um, QQ's turn ends, right? We need to try to gamble again. So what is the pros to this uh, skill cycle? Uh, 
like, like I mentioned over here, it has the highest possible single turn damage by far, right, compared to any other ultimate cycles that Tinjo can do. And it stacks really, really well with external supports such as Harmony and Hility Unit to set up a scenario where you can essentially one hit KO at enemy target, right? So if they already have a defense down and your Bronya cast her ultimate, your Bronya gave Tinjo her E buff, your Tinjo cast her ultimate, like, so all these combined, it will allow Tinjo to output just an insane, insane amount of damage, right? So this is the, basically the one hit KO move, right? The killer move, right? Your Bankai, right? So this is basically it. Now the cons is, of course, it is not very consistent, right? Because after this insane one hit KO move is um, released, uh, and the boss is still not dead, then it will require our player to once again obtain four of a kind within um, the skill point usage at the next round, right? If we do not get four of a kind in the next round, then we're going to lose overall damage when the battle drags on, right? Because we basically summon one huge Bankai, but the rest of our damage, we, we didn't have enough skill points to allocate because we couldn't get four of a kind. And the crucial, crucial thing in Tinchua is her four of a kind is like the majority of her damage. So not being able to get four of a kind uh, is going to be pretty crippling in terms of her damage output. So what is the ideal situation? When do you want to use this combo with Tinchua, right? You should use this ultimate cycle when you set up with defense breaks, buffs, and you're confident that this buffed ultimate into enhanced attack with all the buffs and all the debuffs can kill our current stage, right? You are confident they can destroy the enemy with this, then go ahead and use this combo. Now, moving on to our last combo, right? Our last ultimate usage. When do you want to use Tinchua's ultimate? Um, this is where we want to stack our skills, but we don't get a four of a kind. However, we still have enough energy to cast our ultimate. So in this scenario, we basically keep spamming our skills, stack up as much skills as possible. Uh, if we don't get four of a kind, it's completely fine. We will just use our ultimate here into our enhanced basic attack. Uh, there is one important criteria to note is that our players must have enough energy to cast ultimate during this turn because like I mentioned, uh, Qin Chue casting her skill will not refund any energy. Right? So when players want to do this combo, they must have enough energy to cast her ultimate. Right? So we basically stack our skill as high as possible and even in the event that we do not have any form of a kind, uh, we can still hit the target with an insane amount of damage uh, from our ultimate, right? Because now our ultimate gained all the damage percentage buff that we would have gotten from our skill usage. So yeah, like I mentioned again, uh, it doesn't require players to obtain four of a kind from skills since the damage percentage buff can be transferred from our ultimate into our enhanced basic attack. So the pros over here, as you can see, it's really RNG friendly. Uh, it's very good for players that continuously fail to get four of a kind because the players can still deal a good amount of damage with our buffed ultimate as well as our buffed enhanced attack after casting our ultimate, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, the damage is still definitely gonna be there. Uh, the cons is number one, uh, this ultimate usage can only be utilized when you have enough energy to out at the very start of a turn. And going back to my previous video on Qin Chue Tao analysis, this ties back to the point of being reckless with our skill points, right? This is why players can continuously uh, spam our skill points, three skill points, four skill points, if we can cast our ultimate. Because in the event that we lose the four of a kind, we still get a ton of damage from this uh, combo, right? Um, also, another con is we have to gamble for next four of a kind again, right? Because after using our enhanced basic attack from casting our ultimate, then Tinjo has no more tiles left and she'll need to regenerate the tiles again. So what is the ideal situation where you want to use this ultimate? Right? Uh, it is when you have enough energy to out, but you find yourself not having enough skill points to use multiple skills and ensuring four of a kind, right? So maybe you only have like one skill point or two skill points. So in this case, you could just dump all your skill points there and buff your ultimate into an enhanced basic attack, right? So that is uh, the ideal situation. So that wraps up for Qing Chue's ultimate usage. As you can see, she's really, really fluid. And when you use her ultimate, it really depends on the kind of scenario, the kind of situation that you are in, right? So it's definitely gonna differ uh, from every single battle and learning how to use Qing Chue's ultimate is gonna be crucial in uh, making you become a great Qing Chue player. Now, Relic recommendations for Qing Chue. Now, the most important thing here is basically just whether you want to use speed or attack percentage for Qing Chue's um, feet or boots, right? This is the most widely debated topic on Qing Chue. Other than this, then uh, the consensus are generally the same, all right? She runs a very, very typical DPS set. So, um, yeah, it is still a very widely debated topic even in CN uh, because for the players that believe in attack percentage feat, uh, they think Qing Chue gains more free tiles from allies because as we know, if our Qing Chue is slower and our allies is faster, then every single time it reaches our allies turn, Qing Chue can get a free tile. Alright, also on top of that, you also have 
higher personal damage from your outs because having more attack is always going to translate to more damage since Chinchua doesn't gain any form of bonus damage from gathering speed unlike Sealy's Light Cone, right? So that's that for attack percentage. But on the side of players who believe the speed is better, it is because this translates to faster Chinchua turns which directly translates to more skill point generation as well as energy generation, right? For her to cast the ultimate more frequently. Uh, keep in mind, for both of these debates, uh, they are not factoring in any sort of like bonus turn mechanics, right? such as from Bronya's E, right? In that sense, the moment Chinchua is paired with Bronya, then using attack percentage on Chinchua becomes much better because uh, very similar to what I said in my um, Sile unit analysis, uh, the reason why Sile is so good and she doesn't really need to use speed is because her resurgence gives her a bonus turn and bonus turns don't really care what speed you have. You can have 100 speed, you have 200 speed, bonus turn is a bonus turn. So with that, uh, out of the way, let's first look at the single skill damage comparison. Right? So this is not a DPS simulation of like a 5 cycle, 10 cycle MOC. This is strictly just how much damage each skill does uh, comparing speed to attack. So how much actual damage does this 43.2% attack translate into? So for the assumption that we're using for our calculator here, uh, everything else is basically exactly the same. We're using a crit rate body with attack percentage rope and quantum damage sphere. Exact same substats, sets, enemy, which is basically Coca-Cola, uh, same levels, same light cone, which in this case we're going to be using Genius light cone, or same idolons and same traces. The only difference here is basically speed boots versus attack boots or feet. Right. So this is our finding. As you can see over here, our speeds enhance attack average to 27,000, slightly around 28,000 for the main target as well as 11,000 for the adjacent targets. Then for our ultimate, she does around 26,000. So this is for speed boost. Then if you look over here at the attack, it's going to be roughly 32,000 for the target and 13,000 for the adjacent targets. And then for the ultimate, it's going to be 30,000. So I've taken the liberty of translating this into um, a percentage. So the additional final damage with attack percentage boots, it is roughly 15.9%, uh, right? So almost 16% if players were to use attack percentage. So this is the uh, general numbers you're going to be seeing here. Keep in mind, this is not factoring any supports, right? So this is just strictly Ching Chue alone. And why I say this, uh, it's going to be coming into importance later on. CN Bro's opinion on why we want to use speed feed, and this also happens to be Chie and Mitten's opinion as well, that they both believe that speed boots on Ching Chue is going to be better. Now, here are the, here are the benefits. So number one, Ching Chue has an insane amount of attack buffs herself. Right, as well as from potential supports. Right, so as you can see over here, at level 12 tracers, Chinchue gets a roughly 79% attack buff from getting form of kind. So that's just Chinchue alone. And then you can see from all our Bronya, our Yu Kong, our Tingyun, our Asta, uh, they all provide some form of attack buff, right? So every single harmony unit in the game provides attack buff. So, and as we know, stacking attack it is not optimal, uh, unlike defense reduction, right? Uh, to understand more about this, please see uh, my video that I'm going to be linking it up here. So attack is definitely not a stat that uh, gets better and better the more you stack it because uh, attack percentage is based Based off your base attack. So the higher you stack, uh, the less effective it's going to get. All right, so that's number one. Number two, Ching Chue with speed can actually hit 1, 2, 3 speed with zero subs, right? Uh, which is one speed off of 1, 2, 4 speed. Now, why is 1, 2, 4 speed important? Uh, it's because if we take a look at our speed sheet over here, if we were to achieve 1, 2, 4 speed with Ching Chue, uh, for every six absolute turns in MOC, we can now have an additional two turns from Ching Chue, right? So at, she'll get, she's going to have eight unit turns herself. So this is really, really close to the threshold of 1, 2, 4. And going back, uh, if we were to get a little bit more speed, right, such as 11 more speed from speed subs and allow Ching Chue to hit 1, 3, 4, uh, then this allows our Ching Chue to basically have 6 unit turns for every 4 absolute turns. And this is why I say 1, 3, 4 is such a nice number to have, right? So number 1, you get 6 turns out of every 4 turns, and number 2, you basically get to go twice for your very first turn, right? So 1, 3, 4 is uh, one of the best numbers to hit, uh, generally speaking, for most units, right? Supports, tanks, all this kind of stuff. For 1, 3, 4 is the magic number. And Qing Xue is really not that far off if you were to build the speed boots on her. Uh, if you're going to be building attack boots, they're probably never going to reach this 1, 3, 4. Um, then, uh, this trans what does this translate into? This translates into two more skill points every four to six turns with speed boost team trip. Uh, and these skill points can then be utilized either by herself to gain more skills, which translates into more tiles or more damage percentage buffs. Uh, or it can be used by her allies, right? Her allies, her supports, her tanks, her, her healers. You can use it for buffs and healing, all this kind of stuff. So this makes combat with Ching Chue, right? Speed Ching Chue, way more fluid and adaptable to situations compared to attack percentage uh, because you're faster, right? So in case there's ever a sudden crowd control or a debuff or suddenly uh, your Ting Yun gets to rate health again, uh, at 
least you now have the additional skill points uh, generated by a faster Qing Quan to use your heals and scalps up, right? So that's why I say it's more adaptable. And the last point uh, is that it is generally a more viable path for sub DPS Qing Quan, all right? Because sub DPS Qing Quan, she basically only wants to auto attack. And then all our skill points generated by our fast Qing Quan can then be allocated to our main DPS and supports. Uh, even for main DPS, uh, this can still be a viable build. Uh, why is this case? Because of all this amount of attack buffs that Qing Quan is already getting, right? There's uh, such an insane amount of attack buffs that um, having the extra 43% attack buff is not a game changer, right? So this is the camp of um, why should you use speed on Qing Quan. Now on the other side of why you should use attack on Qing Quan, right? Uh, number one is that if Qing Quan is too fast, uh, which basically means she's so fast that she's going before her supports, uh, this will greatly reduce Qing Quan's damage output, right? Because our supports buff will not be able to reach Qing Quan, at least for the very first turn. And keep in mind, Qing Quan actually has a 10% speed buff herself after using enhanced basic attack, right? So this is from the A6 traces. So it might eventually ruin the turn order um, if the rest of our team have no other means of getting extra speed speed or action value, right? So this is gonna be an issue if our Qing is too fast. Number two, a high speed Qing especially for main DPS Qing it will result in a higher skill point usage. Uh, now I say it's a good thing if your Qing is very fast and you are just using her for a sub DPS and she's just gonna be auto attacking. But if you're gonna be using a main DPS, right? A high speed Qing means um, you still want to get four of a kind and you still want Qing to cast all her buffs, right? So the more times it is reaches Qing Chue's turn, then the more likely you're gonna be spending her skill points, right? So, um, slower speed teams, especially if the rest of the speed is not able to keep up with this uh, fast Qing Chue, uh, they will not be able to provide enough buffs for Qing Chue, right? Because all our skill points is basically being utilized by our, fa our faster Qing Chue. Uh, this is made even worse if our player is unlucky. Because keep in mind, uh, if our Qing Chue is very fast, and let's just say if it's just our Qing Chue turn very fast, and then Qing Chue were to use all her skill points, and then she couldn't get 4 of a kind, and then she go next, uh, now it takes even longer to generate back the skill points because our Qing Chue is so fast, and then it's going to eventually reach her turn again. Right? So this is definitely a thing to keep in mind uh, of. Right? So for number 3, for Harmony supporters like Ting Yun, Bronya, and Yu Kong, um, their buffs will expire faster with a high speed Qing Chue, right? Because uh, it is a turn sooner. So this is a pretty much of a no-brainer here. Uh, and lastly, the total damage from attack percentage Qing Chue will still out-damage speed Qing Chue, right? I think this is a very important point, right? Because no matter how you want to put it, uh, you can generate more skill points, generate more energy from every every four to six turns, right? In the scenario where if you were to kill an enemy within two or three turns, attack percentage benefit is going to far outweigh um, speed benefit. Like I mentioned over here, right? If the battle ends really quickly, there is no chance for Speed Qing Chue to actually gain the extra turn uh, before the battle is over. Right? She will never ever manage to generate the extra skill point because the enemies already did from the bonus damage generated by attack percentage Qing Chue. So what is the summary over here? Right? From a future proving perspective, and this is uh, generally what I believe as well, attack percentage uh, should be more favorable, right? Because we want to consider that MOC battles are starting to last much shorter the better our unit development gets. For now, you can take a look at all the CN whales or even the English whales. Uh, the zero turn clears with Qing Chue, right? They are all going to be using attack percentage boots. If you are already clearing content with Qing Chue in zero turns, then it is very unlikely that our speed boots Qing Chue will actually be able to catch up and provide the extra skill points and all the utility that a speed Qing Chue will be able to provide. So that's one. Uh, but but uh, that being said, if your Qing Chue is being played as a sub DPS, that is to say you're not going to be using a lot of skill points with Qing Chue, you're not going to be using a skills much, and you do not have the capabilities to swiftly end the fight like before two or three turns, right? Then running speed for more skill points, for more energy regeneration uh, would be more beneficial for your entire team, right? For fulfilling her role as a sub DPS essentially. So that's the general summary of uh, when you should use attack percentage or speed Qing Chue. So that's the more difficult part, and now we come to the basically easy part of the CAU analysis. Right. So for the set and stat recommendations, like I mentioned, um, it's really quite similar. It doesn't really matter if you're going to be bringing her as a main DPS or a sub DPS, uh, it's really very similar. right? So for the main four piece, we're going to be using Genius, uh, no brainer. And for the two piece, we're actually going to be running a Rutilant Arena, which is the new 1.2 piece. right? But unfortunately, this piece is not out yet. I think we still need another 
eight or nine more days from the recording of this video. So until this set is released, uh, feel free to just uh, use South Soto. I don't think it's that big of a difference as to whether this set can heavily out damage South Soto. We're going to have to come back to this in the future. I'll probably just make a completely separate video on ranking how good these relics are. So that's generally Ching Chue's sets. Now for the stats, it's super super standard as compared to any main DPS. Uh, you're gonna be running crit chance or crit damage chest, uh, speed or attack, and this whole speed and attack thing have already been covered over here, so just feel free to refer to that. Uh, for your rope, you're gonna be running attack percentage and your sphere is gonna be quantum damage. And then for your stop stats, it's super typical DPS stuff, crit and crit damage above attack slash speed. Right, so this is it. Uh, one thing I want to just say here before we move on is that this Chinese thing here basically says 除非特殊事件套效果要求所有的主席副词条双爆永远比套装重要 So this essentially means unless a special 4-piece effect is the requirement, right? Like the 4-piece effect is ridiculously ridiculous good. Then generally for players, and this doesn't just apply to Chin Chui, right? This applies to every single unit. Our main stats is always going to be our priority followed by our sub stats followed by the actual set itself. Because if you think about it, the set bonuses, right, is really not that impactful. So the most important thing, especially for us players in the earlier game, uh, please focus on your main stats and then your subsets first, right? The sets really don't matter that much. And for the last sentence, 这是从原神到新铁都通用的道理,除非事件套效果必不可少, right? So this means uh, it is the same concept from Genshin to HSR, right? They're both same in both games, unless the four-piece effect is extremely, extremely good. A bonus section, right? QQ's Idolands and her playstyles. Now, this section is basically drafted up by Cheye as well as Mittens. It's still a document in progress, but you guys can see the uh, mock-up we have over here. Uh, it has an extensive write-up ranging from how you want to play Ching Chui, how you want to go around with a team composition, all that kind of stuff, ranging from pre-E4, E4 to E5, E6, E6 with Bronya, all that kind of stuff. So what this document looks like essentially is I'm going to be showing you over here. Uh, this is how the document looks like. Uh, feel free to go take a look if you want to, and I'll also be providing the link uh, once this review video is uploaded, right? So that is that. Now, like on recommendation for Chinchui. Once again, this is also really straightforward. Before Dawn is definitely going to be the best uh, erudition light cone by far compared to any other light cone. But uh, Peaceful Day, which is the Battle Pass light cone, is an excellent choice, uh, especially at S5, right? Because the damage percentage you get from Peaceful Day is really, really high, and Chinchui has a lot of attack buffs. So what she needs is definitely going to be some for damage percentage buff. Uh, even though you can get it from her skills, but uh, especially for sub DBS Chinchui, we're not going to be using her skills that much. Then this Peaceful Day is definitely an Excellent choice, even better than Himeko's light cone, which is the 5 star light cone, unfortunately. Uh, however, the downside is that this battle pass light cone requires quite a lot of dupes. Uh, minimally, you need 3 dupes for it to out damage S5 seriousness of breakfast. Until then, a uh, breakfast S5 is gonna give you better damage, and you have to consider breakfast is something that I think is really easy to obtain because it is basically sold from the Forgotten Horse Shop, right? So I think players should generally have a copy of S5 breakfast. So if you're free to play player or you're just a battle pass player that haven't really have enough copies of this peaceful day yet, then feel free to use S5 uh, breakfast. Right. A genius is a possible last option, uh, but it is not recommended since breakfast is easily obtainable, right? Since this is going to be much harder to obtain and the effects is definitely not going to be as good as an S5 breakfast. So that is that for Ching Chui's like core recommendation. Super, super straightforward. Now we have come to the final part of our CNU analysis, which is the team composition, right? So due to Ching Chui's innate damage and attack buffs, uh, Nihility characters generally function better with Ching Chui, right? Because they're able to provide some sort of utility such as speed down and defense down, both of which allow Ching Chui to increase the chances of getting four of a kind because the enemy is slower, so it's going to be your turn uh, more frequently, right? As well as the final damage output because uh, I've already mentioned before, uh, defense down is really, really broken. Uh, particularly defense down, right? Because any quantum unit, especially if you're going to be playing Ching Chui in the mid to end game, they're going to be running 4-piece Genius set. And that gives you a 20% defense penetration against a quantum enemy, right? So this is already 20% defense down. And if you pair with any of the Nihility characters that gives you even more defense down, the damage is going to further increase even more. And to know why stacking defense downs is so good, please check out to my previous video where I explained why, um, how defense break mechanics work. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that Harmony characters are not useful, but it's rather that their buffs can be better utilized uh, on other units, right? Because especially when I consider in MOC, we only have two teams, right? So generally speaking, if the other team is you're basically like, running a Sile or a Qingyuan and this kind of stuff, uh, they will generally benefit more from like this kind of Harmony characters. Um, I'm not saying they're not useful though, all right? So let's take a look at some of the Harmony characters. So Yu Kong is actually really, really good for sub DPS QQ because you can pair sub DPS QQ with another main DPS, right? And the reason why this is a case, uh, please check out my Yu Kong CNU analysis as to uh, where I mentioned how sub DPS comms actually work with Yu Kong. So that's for Yu Kong. And Bronya, uh, Bronya is basically, basically a special case because extra turn is basically good on any unit in the game, right? So Bronya is always going to be good, but unfortunately in this game, we only have one Bronya, right? You can't have two Bronyas, unfortunately. So generally speaking, Hedy units will give you more value while Bronya can be used uh, for the other team, right? So, so that's how you get it. It's opportunity cost, essentially. Now, one thing to know uh, before going on uh, is that Without how many buffers, that's uh, you're gonna be running the Hility D buffers, uh, QQ has now more demand for attack percentage boots, right? Because now, without our harmony supports, then we don't really have any extra sort of, of attack percentage. And so this is where attack percentage boots can really, really help change DPS if we're gonna be pairing her with all the Nihility units. So here are some of the sample teams that I've drafted up. You can pair Qin Chue with Sile, with Silver Wolf into Luocha. So this is a really, really typical uh, future mono quantum disc. This Luocha is probably going to be replaced by Fu Xuan or Lynx, right? So this is a pretty standard mono quantum. And this team is basically the Nihility team with Welt, Qin Chue, Pella, and Luocha. Welt is probably going to be your main DPS. Qin Chue can act as your sub DPS, and Pella can just be there to just help everybody, right? So this is like your Nihility based composition. And then another team is basically our two in one, right? So Yu Kong is going to help provide uh, damage buffs to both our main DPS Chinchu over here and our sub DPS being Silver Wolf. So this is going to be really, really ideal as well. And for the last one, Chinchu can definitely still function with our Harmony supports, right? She can definitely function with Bronya, a Ting Yun, all this kind of stuff with one healer. Uh, but it's just the only reason why I didn't really recommend this is because this comp is essentially a very universal comp, right? So Chinchu here can be replaced with anyone. And generally speaking, Chinchu pairing with debuffers uh, are really, really good, right? So it's really just about opportunity cost. So yeah, we have come to the end of this episode CNU analysis featuring Ching Chue. I think at the bottom line, Ching Chue is just a super, super fun unit to play once you really get into how her kit works and we want to use her ultimate. And personally for me, I never really looked into Ching Chue until the time I started to do this CNU analysis because uh, now I've really discovered this whole side of Ching Chue where like, she can actually be a really, really good sub DPS. And once I have enough resources, I'm definitely going to raise her up and pair her up with Sile for my future content. Right? Furthermore, if you're a will, basically you already have an E6 Qin Chue, then her damage output is really, really high. There has been some documentations where against the right enemies such as AoE mobs and all this kind of stuff, E6 Qin Chue can actually out damage an E0 Sile uh, if she eats all the right buffs at the right time, right? Because once the enemy is dead, the enemy is dead. You don't really need to care about it that much. So Qin Chue's damage potential is really, really not to be underestimated. So that's all I have today. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.